everyone, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Edith Harold, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host this webinar discussing the certification of state law questions by federal courts. This panel features as speakers, the Honorable Rachel Wainer After, who serves as Justice on the Supreme Court of New Jersey, the Honorable Benjamin Beaton, who serves on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Kentucky, and the Honorable Sarah Campbell, who serves as Justice on the Supreme Court of Tennessee. As moderator, we are joined by the Honorable Jennifer Perkins, who serves on the Arizona Court of Appeals, Division I. If you'd like to learn more about today's moderator or speakers, their full bios can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. During the program, we may turn to audience for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that, as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federalist Society. With that, Judge Perkins, thank you for joining us today, and I'll hand things over to you. Great. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Edie, for that introduction, and thank you to the audience for joining us today um, and those who will watch this later, I suppose. Uh, I will just very briefly introduce the speakers in topic uh, before we will kick things off. As Edie pointed out, more robust biographical information is available on the program page found on the Federal Society's website. Um, and just to give credit where it's due, I'm noting at the outset that a, a fair amount of my information uh, when I chime in comes from articles authored by Professor Rachel Breland um, in the 2024 Fordham Law Review. Uh, professors Jason Cantone and Carly Giffen in a 2021 University of Toledo Law Review, and Judge David Nuffer in his Duke Law Program thesis from 2018. Okay, certification. As we have just been discussing, kind of a big topic, so we're not going to plumb the depth today. Um, just give a little bit of an introduction to the topic itself, just to the, the nuts and bolts. Um, certification through this process as generally understood, a federal court may send an unsettled state law issue to the highest court of the relevant state to address the issue in the first instance. Some states do allow certification of issues internally and between state courts, uh, but today we are focused on the federal to state practice. Florida is the state that originated allowance of this practice back in 1945. Um, but it didn't immediately promulgate related rules and the practice was largely dormant until 1960 when Justice Frankfurter Writing for the court commented favorably on Florida's law in the Clay versus Sun Insurance Office limited opinion. At that time, Justices Black and Douglas raised concerns with certification in their dissents, uh, could result in piecemeal decision making, it's a long and expensive road to justice, etc. But soon thereafter, heeding Justice Frankfurter's encouragement, the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws approved a uniform act for state certification laws. Adoption still didn't really take off until after one more SCOTUS weigh-in, Lehman Brothers versus Shine in 1974. There, Justice Douglas, I'm not sure, perhaps having spent more time with Justice Frankfurter talking about this, uh, this time wrote for the court, and they vacated and remanded the judgment for the Second Circuit to consider whether it should certify questions to the Florida Supreme Court. So not obligatory, but I guess a very strong suggestion from the high nine. Um, the court noted that it would, in the long run, save time, energy, and resources and help build a cooperative judicial federalism. It's a term I think might come up again later. Uh, certification was particularly appropriate in sign, according to Justice Douglas at this point, in view of the novelty of the question and the great unsettlement of Florida law on that question presented, which was whether Florida would hold a corporate officer who disclosed confidential earnings projections to outsiders liable based on a theory of misappropriating corporate assets, uh, excuse me, assets. The Second Circuit, somewhat unsurprisingly, took the suggestion and the Florida Supreme Court answered the questions, thus resolving that case. And since then, 49 states in the District of Columbia have adopted some system for certification. So each time certification occurs, there are two exercises of discretion, the federal court's initial decision that the issue presented is appropriate for certification, and then the state court gets to make the same evaluation, whether the issue is, is appropriate for acceptance of that certification. So this sort of two-step discretionary profit process is going to provide the playground for our ruminations today. 
Um, I think we're going to use a little bit loosely as our framework the experience of the Sixth Circuit and the state of Tennessee in the Lindenburg versus Jackson National Life Insurance Company case. This is a Sixth Circuit opinion issued in 2018. Um, I, I'll note we, we intend for this to be a conversational um, hour together. We welcome your questions. As Edie mentioned, I will attempt to stay on top of them. So please use the Q&A function and we'll see what we can uh, what we can get to. So starting our conversation today and, and helping us to lay the groundwork with the Lindenburg case is, uh, as mentioned, Justice Sarah Campbell of the Tennessee Supreme Court. Um, I'll just briefly note before her appointment to that court in 2022, Justice Campbell served in the Tennessee Attorney General's Office as Associate Solicitor General and Special Assistant to the AG. Following Justice Campbell's comments, we will hear from Justice Rachel Weiner Apter of the New Jersey Supreme Court, also a 2022 appointee. Immediately preceding her appointment, Justice Apter served as the director of the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights. And after we get, I imagine what will be a fairly robust state law perspective, we will give Judge Benjamin Beaton um, of the Federal District Court in the Western District of Kentucky the opportunity to weigh in. And before he joined the bench in 2020, Judge Beaton was a trial and, and, and of particular expertise an appellate litigator in private practice. Um, I'm going to attempt to bring in, as I mentioned, the questions those submitted, those that happen to inspire me along the way. Um, and I've done a little bit of digging into the certification as an issue here in my home state of Arizona. So as relevant, I may bring in some of those statistics. Uh, but for now, Justice Campbell, would you like to get us started? Sure. Thank you, Judge Perkins. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us. I'm really um, happy to be here and especially happy to be here with to um, good friends and very um, highly respected um, jurists. So it's, it's great to be with you today. Um, so as Judge Perkins mentioned, before I was on the Tennessee Supreme Court, I was in the Tennessee Attorney General's office. And that was actually um, where my experience with the Lindenburg case began. Um, I, I worked on it a bit when I was in the Attorney General's office when we filed a cert petition um, from the Sixth Circuit's decision. So. Let's go all the way back to 2011. That is when Tennessee's legislature passed a law capping both punitive and non-economic damages. Um, so there was a breach of contract action that included a bad faith breach of contract claim that was originally filed in Tennessee state court. It was removed to federal court um, pursuant to diversity jurisdiction. And the plaintiffs um, in that case eventually obtained a quite large um, punitive damages award. Um, the district court capped that pursuant to the cap on punitive damages, the statutory cap on punitive damages. Um, the plaintiffs challenged that cap as unconstitutional under the Tennessee Constitution, claiming that it violated the separation of powers provision and the Tennessee constitutional right to a jury trial. So the district court certified those constitutional questions to the Tennessee Supreme Court under Tennessee's uh, Rule 23. It's the Tennessee Supreme Court Rule 23. Different states have different ways of kind of outlining their certification procedure in Tennessee. It's a Tennessee Supreme Court rule. Um, so the, the court certified the questions. The Tennessee Supreme Court actually declined to accept the certified questions. It issued an order explaining why, and the primary reason was that there was an antecedent question about whether punitive damages were even available at all for the bad faith breach of contract claim. Um, that question had not been certified and it had not been resolved. So under Tennessee's rule, the certified questions have to be determinative of the cause. And because it appeared that the constitutional questions may not be, um, the court declined to accept the certified questions. The order, however, um, did point out that nothing in that order should be um, interpreted as precluding the Sixth Circuit from later certifying the same questions. So the case goes up to the Sixth Circuit, and the state um, who has intervened in the case to defend the constitutionality of damages caps asks the Sixth Circuit to certify um, in a footnote in its brief. The other parties don't ask for certification, but uh, at oral argument, they were asked about it. Nobody objects. So everyone uh, agrees that certification is appropriate, um, but the Sixth Circuit panel does not certify the question. And instead it holds that the punitive damages cap is unconstitutional, um, relying on Tennessee's uh, jury trial provision in the Tennessee constitution. 
Um, there, uh, there was a dissent, Judge Larson dissented, um, disagreed on the constitutional question, but also pointed out that certification was, was appropriate, um, highly appropriate in this case. There was a petition for rehearing on Bach, which the, the full Sixth Circuit denied. Um, Judge Bush wrote a, a strong dissent from the denial of rehearing, um, again, arguing that certification was appropriate and also urging the Sixth Circuit to establish some guidelines um, for you know, how to exercise its discretion with respect to certification. Uh, there was another separate opinion, which this is kind of an interesting procedural issue, just making the point that this panel's decision to decline to certify would not preclude a future uh, panel or federal district court from certifying the questions um, at a later date. All right, so that's the state of the law um, in the Sixth Circuit that the punitive damages cap is unconstitutional. A couple of years later, a similar issue involving the constitutionality of the non-economic damages cap um, made its way to the Tennessee Supreme Court also via certification, um, another case that was in federal court pursuant to diversity jurisdiction. So that question, uh, the constitutional questions again were certified. And this time, the Tennessee Supreme Court accepted the certified questions and held in a decision called McClay versus Airport Management Services um, that the non-economic damages cap is constitutional. Um, it dropped a footnote saying, this was before I was on the court, I should say, um, dropped a footnote pointing out that Lindenberg had reached a different conclusion um, with respect to the punitive damages cap. Uh, made clear that McClay was not addressing the punitive damages cap, but also indicated that um, it found the Sixth Circuit's reasoning in Lindenburg unpersuasive. So as things currently stand, um, we have a Sixth Circuit decision holding that the punitive damages cap is unconstitutional, and we have a Tennessee su Supreme Court decision holding that the non-economic damages cap is constitutional. Um, it appears that um, in the wake of these decisions, federal district courts in the Sixth Circuit are still um, following Lindenberg's holding with respect to punitive damages. And so this is a, a great case, I think, to tee up some of the interesting questions that we'll be talking about today. Great. Uh, Justice After, would you like to talk to us? I think New Jersey has some distinctions uh, in, in your process there. So if you could highlight some of those and, and keep the conversation going. Sure. Um, thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge how happy I am to be participating um, with um, close friends, Justice Campbell and Judge Beaton, and how happy I am to have gotten to know Judge Perkins through this process. Um, and I think that this is a really interesting topic. Um, Judge Perkins shared some of the national history of certification. I wanted to share some of the New Jersey specific history um, because it is um, somewhat unique. Um, so first, just to take a step back, certification of state law questions by federal courts really only arose after the Supreme Court's decision in Erie versus Tompkins in 1938, um, in which Justice Brandeis for the court held that federal courts sitting in diversity jurisdiction must apply state substantive law and cannot create or apply federal common law. And so that leads to the question in some cases of what is the state common law on a particular question. Um, for example, the one that um, Justice Campbell just discussed, and it can require federal courts to predict how a state's highest court would decide a particular question. Um, so throughout, um, between the 1970s and the 1990s, um, increasing states adopted certification procedures and federal judges in the Third Circuit and the District of New Jersey begin to urge in public op published opinions, resolutions, law review articles, et cetera, New Jersey to establish such a certification procedure. It still did not have one um, in the 1990s. 
uh, the New Jersey State Bar Association also urged the court to adopt a certification procedure. Um, and one example of how the Third Circuit was urging this in published opinions is a case in 1995 um, in which Judge Becker, who was joined only on this point by then Judge Alito, now Justice Alito, and Judge Nygaard, um, wrote, so he wrote in an opinion specifically, quote, the lack of a certification procedure disadvantages both New Jersey and the federal judiciary, especially in cases where little authority governs the result, the litigants are left to watch the federal court spin the wheel. In effect, we're forced to make important state policy in contravention of basic federalism principles. Um, so after that decision in the late 1990s, um, the New Jersey Supreme Court tasked New Jersey's existing six-person civil practice committee with reporting on whether the court should adopt a certification procedure. Um, four members of the six-person committee supported creating a certification procedure. Um, they recommended that the New Jersey Supreme Court adopt a rule that would allow it to answer a question of law certified to it by an appellate court of the United States or by the highest court of another state, if, the, and I'm quoting here, the answer would be determinative of a pending litigation in the certifying court and New Jersey law on the issue is unsettled. Um, the majority specifically recommended that only federal appellate courts and not federal district courts, sorry, Judge Beaton, um, be permitted to certify questions so that the factual record in each case would be sufficiently developed to provide context for any New Jersey Supreme Court decision. Um, and then two dissenting members of the committee um, believe that a certification process would create undue litigation delay and expense, um, would needlessly burden the court, and would likely be unconstitutional. Uh, the New Jersey Constitution expressly sets forth when quote, appeals may be taken to the Supreme Court, and the dissenting members essentially argued that certified questions are not appeals. Um, but in 1999, the New Jersey Supreme Court adopted Rule 2, colon, 12A, um, which became effective the following year, um, which allows the Supreme Court to answer a question of law certified to it by the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit if the answer may be determinative of an issue in litigation pending in the Third Circuit, and if there's no controlling appellate decision, constitutional provision, or statute in this state. It also allows the court to reformulate any question of law that is certified to it. So the new rule thus allowed the only the Third Circuit and no other court to certify questions to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Um, as I mentioned, that makes New Jersey somewhat unique. Uh, currently, every state but North Carolina allows their state high courts to hear questions certified by federal courts. New Jersey is the only one that does not authorize questions certified by the U.S. Supreme Court. And it's also an outlier in limiting certification to only the Third Circuit and no other federal courts of appeals. Um, 48 states authorize certification from any court of appeal, any federal court of appeals, and most allow certification from district courts as well. Um, since Rule 2 colon 12a went into effect in 2000, the Third Circuit has certified questions of law to the New Jersey Supreme Court in 22 total appeals. The court accepted certification in 14 cases and denied it in seven. Um, in one other, the request for certification was withdrawn. Um, I'm happy to discuss some of those cases or some of the pros and cons um, to certification, and I'm also happy to cede the floor to Judge Beaton to provide a federal perspective and then to come back to those topics. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Oh. Did I freeze? All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, like Rachel and Sarah said, I'm just delighted to um, join with my friends and my new friend, uh, Jennifer, for this uh, panel. I suppose my role is to stand up for the big bad feds and offer a, a few counterpoints to um, my friends uh, on higher state courts um, who, as they will remind us, are um, closer to the people, uh, more accountable, and um, undoubtedly more well-versed with their state's laws, all of which are relevant to many of the justifications, some quite powerful, 
that we find uh, offered uh, in support of uh, certification. Um, as I dug in, uh, which I had to because I've never certified a question, uh, as Rachel mentioned, some uh, states wouldn't even allow me, a lowly trial judge, to, to do so. Um, uh, but as I dug in, I was surprised by a number of things. I expected um, that my priors uh, to lean in a pro um, sort of federalism um, uh, direction, maybe more, maybe that means actually more of an anti federalist um, perspective, um, uh, and, and to be more sympathetic um, uh, by the theory, but skeptical of the efficiency benefits. Um, I remain skeptical of the efficiency benefits, and I am now more skeptical of the doctrinal and uh, jurisprudential foundations as well. You will find in uh, in certification uh, decisions, briefs, uh, arguments, comments, uh, typically unsupported and perhaps unsupportable about how certification saves time, energy, and resources. Uh, and helps build a cooperative judicial federalism. This is from the syllabus of Justice Ginsburg's decision in Arizonans for official English against Arizona. Um, I am not sure that anyone could make the case that taking um, many months, perhaps years, to certify a question to a state Supreme Court, uh, trying to wedge itself in the very uh, crowded docket uh, of a state high court, many of which have much less control um, than uh, what we're familiar with at the U.S. Supreme Court. Kentucky Supreme Court, for example, has a huge mandatory docket that is very time consuming. Um, I, I'm, I'm not con uh, convinced that process would save the time, energy, and resources of anyone except perhaps, very importantly, the trial judge or court of appeals judge uh, or panel that is avoiding that question. Um, uh, it seems like we have questions of varying difficulty involving state law that come across my desk all the time. And my job, as I view it, is to decide those questions, uh, to do so as quickly and as well as I can. Um, and I am hard pressed to think of instances in which uh, the litigants and, frankly, even the development of the law would be uh, uh, net better off if I sent a question out packing uh, to the Kentucky Supreme Court or the Tennessee Supreme Court or what have you. Um, there is an obvious uh, tension, um, shall we say, with the basis for diversity jurisdiction, the reason these questions are in front of me um, in the first place. And... Um, more, more fundamentally, and I'll, I'll perhaps pose this question to uh, my colleagues here. Um, I recognize there is a sort of a felt understanding that in a case in a in a case like Lindenburg, um, uh, it it is somehow more um, offensive, incongruous, seems just seems wronger that this invalidation came from a federal court construing Tennessee's constitution uh, in a Tennessee dispute um, and a conflict with the Tennessee statute. Uh, but it seems to me, Sarah, that this, this fundamentally comes down to um, where are we most likely to find errors and how are we best able to design procedures that avoid errors. And I worry that uh, by teeing up questions uh, as somehow different from the ones that judges like us adjudicate all day, every day, and saying, this is something special, it's different, it needs to go to the state Supreme Court, that we're buying into some of the bad part of Erie uh, and treating state law questions as somehow different than normal legal interpretation that state Supreme Court judges, state trial judges, um, uh, federal trial judges, the US Supreme Court ought to be approaching in a consistent way, trying to get the answer right using the tools at our disposal. And uh, I, I find myself newly questioning whether um, my view on certification is colored more by um, uh, uh, just sort of a gestalt sense that 
it is somehow less bad if the state court screws up than the federal court, because if we get it right, it doesn't matter, presumably. Uh, and I'm curious where that feeling uh, comes from, if it's if it's got more to do with who's likeliest to screw up or more to do with who ought to be making a decision and in what way. Well, I think uh, I think we might start then, Justice Campbell, with a, a response there. I mean, I think Lindenberg itself raises this interesting issue of what happens after a federal court has made a determination and then those litigating under diversity jurisdiction or otherwise are bound by that determination or at least find themselves presumably bound by it, mm -hmm. whereas the state court has now said something uh, quite different, um, perhaps not in the precise circumstance, but in an analogous one. So uh, that does tee up this this question a little bit. I, I welcome your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, you know, I, I appreciate your um, commitment to exercising your unflagging um, jurisdiction as the federal court. And, you know, I do think that, you know, your comments really highlight the tension here. You know, our founders designed a system where federal and state courts do have overlapping authority. You know, state courts can adjudicate both federal and state law issues. Federal courts can also adjudicate both federal and state law issues. So, you know, there is going to be, you know, some conflict, just given that overlapping authority. And I think what to me really points up the need for a certification procedure is the fact that when a federal court does get it wrong, makes an incorrect, eerie guess, um, the only way that a state court can correct that error is to wait for an appropriate case to arise in um, the state court system so that it can you know, hear that case or hear that issue and decide that issue um, definitively. And so, you know, and there are a few factors here that that um, have made that possibility, I think, even more likely. Um, and in our current times, you know, you have a diversity uh, monetary threshold that hasn't been increased in three decades. Um, you have the Class Action Fairness Act, um, which kind of relaxes diversity requirements. So you have, you know, various factors, I think, combining to remove certain kinds of cases from the state courts. I mean, there are certain kinds of disputes that are just kind of end up in federal court. Um, and it's a state court might be, you know, waiting years um, or, or perhaps, um, you know, never really get a case that presents that same issue. So there is a chance of error, you know, when, it, and by contrast, when, you know, when my court decides an issue of federal law, for example, and let's say we decide that issue incorrectly, the U.S. Supreme Court can take that case and correct that error. So I think that's where you have uh, a little bit of an imbalance where um, the maybe it's not more likely that a federal court would make an error with respect to state law, but it's just that the means of correcting that error um, are, are a little um, harder to come by. So I do think that certification um, is a really important procedure to protect our federal state balance. And I, I do I think the Lindenberg case just really is a great illustration of that. Um, but I, uh, I acknowledge that um, federal courts have the authority to decide state law questions and often do a really good job at that. Um, so it's not the case that a federal court needs to just certify every state law issue that comes before it. I don't think state courts would be I'm a big fan of that approach. But um, but I, you know, I do think that these federalism um, concerns that have animated the the adoption of the certification procedure to begin with you know, are really important and just ought to be considered um, when courts are making the discretionary decision whether to certify. Um, and it is, you know, I, I think it, it ought to be discretionary. Um, and there are a lot of different factors that come into play in deciding whether it's warranted. But I think there are circumstances where it is clearly warranted and uh, important to preserve our federal state balance. Um, I agree um, with Sarah um, to a large extent, and I think that the entire goal of certification is to avoid problems associated with federal courts predicting how a state's highest court would decide a question of state law and predicting it 
incorrectly. Um, but I think that there are a few caveats that explain why um, I also agree with Ben that certification should not be something um, that is relied on in every case or um, or in even a large number of cases. I think the Third Circuit certifying a total of 22 cases to the New Jersey Supreme Court since in the past 25 years and New Jersey accepting 14 of them. Um, makes it clear that at least um, here it is used um, very sparingly. Um, and the point that I would make there is the New Jersey Supreme Court rule specifically provides that the Supreme Court can answer a certified question if it would be outcome determinative, which is a given, but also if there's no controlling state law authority, i.e. no controlling appellate division decision, um, in our um, appellate division cases, once an appellate division um, decision is published, it's then precedential on other um, appellate courts, other intermediate appellate um, panels in New Jersey. Um, so if there's no controlling appellate division decision, constitutional provision or statute in this state. And I think that that makes clear that in ordinary run of the mill cases of statutory interpretation of a New Jersey statute, or even constitutional interpretation of the New Jersey Constitution, where it seems like the Constitution is providing very clear guidance on how to answer the question, or whether it seems like the statute is providing very clear guidance on how it should be interpreted or applied, um, the New Jersey Supreme Court ordinarily would not accept certification in such a case. It's really only where there is no controlling authority. So the statute would have to be unclear. The constitutional provision, of course, would have to be unclear. And it really arises um, in New Jersey more often in common law cases, um, where, as um, Judge Becker said in that Third Circuit dissent, um, and if, quote, in effect, we're forced to make important state policy in contravention of basic federalism principles. Um, and state common law is an area where courts are generally guided by fairness. And this was something that I uh, that actually was very new to me um, when I joined the New Jersey um, Supreme Court, because I previously had practiced um, much more in federal court, where, as we all know, there is no such thing as federal common law. So you're not really making arguments to um, federal courts that they should change common law in a specific um, way or be guided by fairness in their interpretation of federal common law. Um, but that really is um, still in the province of state courts when it comes to a lot of uh, common law questions. And so I think specifically there, um, that at least has been where the New Jersey Supreme Court has granted um, certification and answered certified questions. Either it's been around how different statutes um, interact or a pure common law um, question or sometimes even a pure court rule question where it's how the New Jersey court rules apply in a particular circumstance. And I think that really, you know, raises this federalism concern about um, not um, what the decision is, but who decides. Yeah, so much of this to me uh, points up uh, real fundamental and interesting questions about you know, what is the role of a judge? And, and in particular, as you say, Rachel, um, a state common law judge and Judge Becker's uh, uh, language about making state policy, I think is really telling. And if you subscribe to a more uh, evolutionary and policy making fairness driven conception of uh, state law, um, even in this late date in which most areas, whether tort or property or what have you, are uh, touched by uh, not just precedent, but also statute and regulation and, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, uniform acts, um, advisory opinions. Uh, there's a lot of law out there at this stage in the Republic's history, much more than when, you know, uh, Pullman abstention uh, emerged. Um, if you view that as policy making, then I totally subscribe that uh, someone who's elected or appointed in a more accountable method, who's much more familiar, closer to the ground, 
uh, ought to be the person making that decision. I find myself more skeptical that there are many instances in which that's actually true and that the judge, whether state or federal, is uh, making policy, so to speak, or uh, ought to be conceiving of his or her role as um, doing, uh, uh, making the best attempt to uh, interpret, understand, and apply the law rather than making a policy decision. When you view it that way, um, the more uh, eerie maximalist view that uh, you know the law is what the state high court says it is, um, then it's hard to think about errors that way um, because they're the decision maker. Um, if you view the judge in a more limited role as an interpreter, uh, then I think uh, the instances in which certification is attractive are fewer and farther between. It's not, not going to be a null set. Uh, there are areas uh, in which there's true expertise or, or broader implications, but a narrower conception of the judge's role, I believe, and uh, a narrow con a conception of the remedy that is available, um, I think can avoid some of these affronts to federalism uh, problems that, Sarah, um, you laid out at the beginning. Just wanted to clarify um, that I agree um, with Ben to a large extent on um, the role of a judge in interpreting statutes and interpreting state constitutional provisions. And um, when it comes to state common law, it is always um, important to recognize that something only continues to exist as state common law um, all the way in 2024 um, because the legislature has declined to act. So in every common law case um, that we get before the New Jersey Supreme Court, it is explicitly because the legislature has declined to act in a particular area, sometimes despite decisions requesting the legislature to act or pointing out that this is really a question of fairness and public policy that should be decided by the legislature. So we even had a common law case um, this term where um, I was in the dissent, um, again, pointing out that this specific issue of it was about um, liability for injury on a sidewalk um, is one that is um, determined based on questions of fairness and public policy and really should be determined by the legislature. Um, and in that case, um, as I said, I was in the dissent um, because I saw um, the majority's decision as an expansion of a common law duty um, that I thought should have been a decision made by the legislature. Um, but there will be common law cases that keep coming in state courts um, in a way that, again, I wasn't used to when I was practicing in federal court um, because the legislature has not acted, um, even despite a request that it do so, and even despite the court saying, you know, this is an area of public policy that really should be decided by the legislature. I, you know, that's to me, um, Steph, that maybe we need a certification procedure whereby we can certify questions to the legislature. So, ooh, that's a fun idea. Um, <laughs> maybe get intermediate courts on um, in on that. Um, <laughs> So just to throw out a, 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 something a little bit akin to what we've been talking about in terms of, of subject matter, something that, that stands out to me from the recent Arizona statistics. So I, I, I talked to the staff attorney's office and between 2011 and 2023, um, the Arizona Supreme Court received 18 uh, certification requests, but only seven of those came in the first six years and 11 of them came in the, the latter six years of that time frame, almost exclusively in bankruptcy and insurance cases. Mm -hmm. um, and our, our staff attorney's office had some kind of sense that it seems like, especially in insurance cases, uh, both district and, and, and circuit courts are, are kicking those uh, questions in particular back. Um, my sense is they're not the most interesting questions for our state Supreme Court, but uh, they've done their best and they haven't declined, at least that I could find a question since uh, 2012. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm curious if any of you in your experience uh, in, in the area of state certification, uh, certification, the one-way certification we currently have available uh, to Justice Campbell's point, if there is a, a, you know, predominance of a particular area of law, um, 
that is driving, if there is an increase in other states, we are seeing an increase or have seen an increase in Arizona in recent years, and it is in those specific subject matter areas. You know, a lot of our questions um, here on the Tennessee Supreme Court, uh, at least during my time on the court, they, they've been mostly just statutory interpretation questions. Um, I'm not as familiar with the questions, you know, before I joined the court. Just by way of comparison, I have some stats from Tennessee um, on numbers and our acceptance rate that might be interesting. So um, since 1999, so in the past you know, 25 years or so, um, we have had 69 uh, Rule 23 requests for certification, and we accepted 41 of those. Um, so that is about a 80% uh, acceptance rate, which based on you know some of the materials I think we all read in preparation for this, looking at other states' acceptance rates is is pretty high. Um, you know, I think there likely have been points in time where there have been certain you know kinds of cases that were getting certified. Um, more than others, just given, you know, a recently enacted statute that, you know, was still um, kind of being applied and interpreted. Um, but but I, I don't have, I guess I don't have a sense of any particular category at this time that is coming to us with increasing frequency. Um, I can speak a little bit to that, and it does actually confirm, Jennifer, um, at least the insurance uh, piece of it. I'm not sure if it's for the same reason um, that the federal court um, was not particularly interested, um, but there is uh, one recent case that was an insurance question. As I noted, uh, since 2000, the Third Circuit has certified 22 questions to the New Jersey Supreme Court, and the New Jersey Supreme Court accepted certification in 14 of them. So it's not nearly as frequent as um, the NFC experience. Um, there are three recent certification decisions. One from 2019 is an insurance case, um, but it's not a statutory interpretation case as much as um, what happens if the specific requirements of the statute are fulfilled, but the intent is not. It involved New Jersey's insurable interest statute. Um, which provided that no person shall procure or cause to be procured any insurance contract upon the life, health, or bodily safety of another individual unless the benefits under that contract are payable to the individual insured or his personal representative or to a person having at the time the contract was made an insurable interest in the individual insured. So the idea there is that... Um, it doesn't allow for insurance policies taken out on the life of a stranger. Um, in this particular 2019 case, a group of investors paid for a life insurance policy through a trust. Um, the insured was a stranger to them, but when the policy was issued, the insurance grandson was the beneficiary. And then five weeks later, the trust was amended and the strangers who invested in the policy became the beneficiaries that had been the plan all along. The district court held that the policy was a stranger originated life insurance policy that violated the statute, um, even though the policy technically com complied with the statute because the insured's grandson had been the beneficiary at the moment that it was signed. Uh, the Third Circuit certified the, the question to this court, and this court held that if a third party without an insurable interest procures or causes an insurance policy to be procured in a way that feigns compliance with the insurable interest requirement, the policy is a cover for a wager on the life of another and violates New Jersey's public policy. So that was kind of a question of what happens if it looks like there's technical compliance with the statute, but not compliance with the purpose of the statute um, to not allow these wagers on the life of another that the beneficiaries um, have no relationship with. Um, and so that was um, an example, I guess, of a recent certification um, question that was accepted that, um, as Jennifer mentioned, is both an insurance question um, and not a straight question of statutory interpretation and more um, a common law, what violates New Jersey's public policy type of question. Other recent certification decisions, one was about the interpretation of a court rule, um, and one was actually about whether um, claims could lie under the New Jersey Consumer Fraud Act or whether they were subsumed under the New Jersey Product Liability Act. So kind of how two different statutes um, could be interpreted harmoniously. 
I have a question for Ben. I'm curious, I think there was a question from uh, one of the audience members about uh, timing. You know, how long does it take? And some of the articles we read, um, you know, I think on some, like, you know, in some cases it could take more than a year for a state court to even decide whether it's going to accept the certified questions. And then, you know, once that decision is made, then there's, you know, the briefing and arguments and um, writing the opinion or whatever, you know, whatever procedure the state court follows. So it can take a long time. And I'm curious, so uh, this Breland article that um, Judge Perkins mentioned at the beginning or at the outset had some recommendations for state courts, things, things that state courts can do to make this a little, uh, a little more efficient. And one of those was um, having a deadline by which, you know, the court will decide whether to certify or to accept certification. So Ben, I mean, my question for you is, you know, how much does, you mentioned efficiency, I think in your opening remarks. So how much does that play into it? Just that this is gonna really drag things out. And if you had more certainty about how long it would take, would you be more likely to certify? I think undoubtedly, yes. Uh, I think a deadline to decide would be helpful. Uh, a deadline to decide whether to decide. Um, of course it would, um, you know, that would come only as the first piece, the second would be the actual decision making on the merits from the state Supreme Court. Uh, but at least you wouldn't, a, a trial judge does or should feel a lot of responsibility for, I think, uh, uh, respecting the time of others and how we manage our dockets when there's a jury in the box, when someone uh, is an accused criminal defendant who is waiting for a day in court. I think that um, aspect of this job informs a lot of our decisions and the idea, at least for me, this is just one judge speaking, I don't think you'll find a doctrinal hook for this anywhere, is, um, you know, pushing something off to a different court out of your jurisdiction whose procedures you aren't terribly familiar with feels like kind of a dodge uh, that will have certain costs for the litigants in front of you with very uncertain benefits. And so to my lights, um, the answer is usually uh, to answer, um, uh, you know, to make the decision to decide, not decide not to decide. Um, uh, but certainly around the margins, there are uh, ways you can help that. Of course, that's an impingement itself, uh, I'll mention, on the autonomy of the state courts uh, who may not want or have um, a, a deadline for deciding when and whether to decide. Um, and uh, I would worry uh, about the incentives that a uh, state court system might create for additional burdensome certification quest if y'all make it too easy on overburdened federal judges um, who I'm sure you don't think are necessarily overburdened relative to your own docket size to uh, pass questions your way. I definitely, um, just a quick comment on that. I, I think that the, um, this is just the first in a two-step process is a, is a big part of that. Um, the, you know, we've, we've recently had a, an opinion issued on a certified question and which the argument, the oral argument for the, before the Arizona Supreme Court occurred in the spring of 2022. So it was a little over two years after the decision to accept certification um, to opinion. Uh, that's a, very unusual. Typically it's faster, but that does uh, certainly impact, I think, the efficiency evaluation. Uh, we had another interesting question. How does certification square with the fundamental rule that courts will not supply advisory opinions? Does anybody have some thoughts on that? Well, I suppose another aspect of federalism is that state courts can sometimes uh, must uh, issue advisory opinions. Uh, so that I think is perhaps a, a, uh, a point on the state side uh, of the scoreboard here, uh, at least if the state court judge uh, is authorized uh, uh, to do that. Um, but again, I, I think the commenter may be driving at um, a, a deeper point that, um, boy, it seems odd to tee up a question um, outside the normal path of adjudication and give it to someone uh, else. I, I wonder if judges 
who grew uncomfortable with um, sort of the oddities of the Brand X and Chevron regime, uh, treating decisions as you know something other than just giving the best reading of a statute, treating a federal court or even a Supreme Court decision as somehow contingent on the action of a different decision maker, in that case, an agency, in this case, a state court, uh, is one of the sort of felt more than uh, uh, necessarily uh, logically driven reasons uh, for uh, some of us to be a little less comfortable with this process. Um, I just wanted to follow up um, and reiterate one thing that um, Ben just mentioned that um, because of the differences in the wording of state constitutions, um, many state courts have very different views of standing than uh, federal courts, and so they do not have the same case and controversy language as Article Three of the federal constitution, and um, the same standing rules um, do not apply, um, not in all state courts. It depends on the wording of their individual state constitutions um, and their own court's precedent. Um, but again, that's something that's very different in state and federal court. There was, as I mentioned, in the um, New Jersey um, committee that was tasked with looking at this two dissenting members that believed that it would not be constitutional um, for the state court to answer certified questions um, under the New Jersey specific language of the New Jersey Constitution. There has never been a constitutional challenge since the certification rule um, was created in um, 2000 or went into effect in 2000. So we did have this. So oh, go ahead, Rachel. One other thing, just in terms of, um, I think it's different from um, the interpretation of a federal agency, regardless of Chevron or Loper Bright. Is that the name of the uh, Supreme Court's recent decision? Um, just because the, um, uh, at least under our rule, um, certification can only be granted if it's outcome determinative in the Third Circuit, and the Third Circuit is only certifying the question if it is. Um, a question of state law that they believe that the New Jersey Supreme Court has the authority to decide and they do not. Um, so I don't think there is a circumstance where a federal court would say, you know, okay, the New Jersey Supreme Court has decided that the New Jersey state law or the way that this statute is read is X or the common law answer is Y, um, but we are not going to abide by that or we're not going to um you know, treated as, as anything other than persuasive authority. I think the reason that the Third Circuit um, is um, certifying a question is because they want the New Jersey Supreme Court to answer it. So on the advisory opinion um, point, so Tennessee's certification procedure um, did face a constitutional challenge. Uh, the case was called Haley versus University of Tennessee Knoxville. Um, it was actually in 2006, which is, which is interesting because the certification procedure had been around for a few decades at that point. Um, so uh, after we had been using it for quite a while, um, there was a constitutional challenge based on um, the constitutional provision that gives the Tennessee Supreme Court appellate jurisdiction. So the argument was that you know, this is not an exercise of the court's appellate jurisdiction to answer certified questions. Um, so the Tennessee Supreme Court uh, rejected that challenge and said that answering certified questions um, is part of its inherent authority as um, the head of Tennessee's judicial branch and sort of distinguished answering a certified question from adjudication, um, you know, whereas adjudication is kind of definitively resolving a case when you're answering a certified question, you're, you're not um, adjudicating a whole case, you're really just answering a single issue. And then, you know, the, the adjudication of the case rests with uh, the federal court that has certified the question. And to my knowledge, we have not had a constitutional challenge since then. All right, we'll try to get, we're, we're winding down here, but we'll try to get to a couple of these questions. Um, we have one that, that asks about the nature of a federal appellate court's projection or best guess as to an issue of state law, how should, and I think perhaps Judge Beaton, I just tag you for this one, because it says, how should, for example, a federal district court view such a ruling? Is it ever truly binding? Unlike a standard matter of, for example, federal statutory interpretation, 
uh, where the meaning of the words is not being continually informed over time, a guess as to how a state's highest court would rule would be continually informed with each release of decisions by the state's highest court. This may impact the argument as to whether a, fellow, a federal appellate court's keeping a state law question is truly creating more efficiency over certification because federal district courts still must make a new evaluation, notwithstanding the appellate ruling. There's kind of an implied question there. And I'll just note that this does tie into the, the first question about the footnote in, in McClay, um, whether or not the Sixth Circuit can continue to persist in its, you know, quote unquote, error. Um, or is Tennessee's rejection of Lindenburg something like a clear statement which should bind, for example, a federal future federal district court? Sounds like they don't think so, uh, per Justice Kimball's earlier comments. But um, Judge Pete, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, I think the point Sarah makes here and in other uh, remarks I've heard about the lock-in effect of an erroneous federal appellate decision on state law questions is probably the most powerful argument in favor uh, in favor of certification. Um, uh, I'll note parenthetically that wouldn't apply to a ruling of mine. Um, I, I can't bind anyone except the parties in front of me. And so I would uh, encourage my federal um, federal trial judges to give it give you your best shot uh, because your analysis of the law can only add, not lock in. Um, it could only add to the understanding of state law, not lock in and, and uh, misperception. Um, but it seems like this uh, opportunity to, uh, for revision of a quote unquote erroneous federal appellate decision uh, makes certification less necessary because I think even on um, a very strong reading of um, Lindenburg and similar decisions, there is an opportunity to revisit it. Now, uh, I'm not sure why federal uh, district judges within our circuit haven't uh, gotten the memo, perhaps, um, and continue to follow Lindenburg. Um, maybe that's a, a, a reminder uh, that complex systems um, can lead to their own errors in the process. Um, but certainly, uh, a panel, uh, and you saw a lot of debate um, at the en banc and the panel level in the Lindenburg decision litigation at the Sixth Circuit. This is an opportunity to revisit those rulings uh, in a way that wouldn't uh, you wouldn't expect, for example, if you had a binding Supreme Court decision on point, and which in theory should allow the Tennessee Supreme Court, you know, more space than might otherwise exist. I think my understanding is that the circuits vary a bit um, on whether a panel a a panel's decision not to certify is itself binding on future panels. Um, and Judge uh, Nal Bandian, I think, talks about this some in his statement respecting the denial of rehearing on Bonk in the Lindenburg case. Um, and that's actually pretty fascinating. Um, and I think it may vary depending on whether um, the circuit allows uh, rehearing on Bonk on state law questions. Um, circuits, I think, vary on that as well. So, um, for example, I think the, the Lindenburg statement, Judge Nalbandian statement, uh, mentions the Fifth Circuit. So I think in the Fifth Circuit, perhaps, maybe getting this wrong, but I think in the Fifth Circuit, they, uh, a panel's decision not to certify is binding on future panels. But the court can grant rehearing on Bonk to address state law issues. So uh, lots of procedural nuances and quirks here that I think make this uh, make this area even more interesting. All right, well, I see us winding down to the to the end of the hour. Um, I'm just going to ask if there are any panel. We do have a couple of questions pending, but since we only have a couple of minutes left, if there are any uh, closing thoughts by any of our panel members, if you want to jump in before we say farewell. I'll perhaps uh, try to write to the defense uh, belatedly of my state court uh, friends. Uh, and note another thing that surprised me in reading um, for this great, or what I found really enjoyable webinar, uh, so many of the early decisions that paved the way towards set of certification that, uh, as we know it today, didn't involve just tricky questions of state law. They involved um, request for anticipatory and in some cases broad uh, federal remedies that would create all sorts of 
erasure fallacy problems and party specific relief problems if we viewed them today. And so I wonder whether um, uh, the teachings of you know, Sam Bray and, and others who have over the last 15 years taught us to think a lot more carefully about things like nationwide injunctions and party specific relief and declaratory rulings, um, if that will uh, uh, mitigate some of those early uh, concerns that the U.S. Supreme Court quite rightly had about broad federal court decisions, often from you know one district judge that could have very broad uh, lock-in effects uh, of their own. So I think that's a an interesting part of the origin story that we're dealing with today in a different way that's nevertheless relevant to certification. Go Great. Ahead. Oh, sorry. I'll just jump in to say that I've really um, enjoyed participating um, and thank you so much um, to Jennifer for moderating and to Edith um, for putting everything together and to the whole team. Um, it has been, it's a really interesting question and one um, that I imagine we all um, have a lot more thinking to do about as well. Yeah, and I'll yeah. just quickly add my thanks um, and just quickly that I do think it's important for state courts to think creatively about how to make the process as efficient as it can be um, for our, our federal counterparts. Yes, um, on behalf of the Federalist Society, thank you to Justice After, Judge Be Beaton, Justice Campbell for speaking, and to Judge Perkins for moderating. We're so grateful for your time and expertise today. Thank you also to our audience for joining us. We greatly appreciate your participation. You can stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars on our website, fedsoc.org, or on all major social media platforms. Thank you once more for tuning in, and we are adjourned. <laughs>